أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستهين والصلاة والسلام على خير الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا الأولين والآخرين شفي المذنبين رحمة للعالمين وحبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأهله الذي سمع في السماء بأحمد وفي العرض بأب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق ولا استقل قائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما لكم لا ترجون لله وقارا وقد خلقكم أطوارا ألم تروا كيف خلق الله سبع سماوات انتباقا وجعل القمر فيهن نورا وجعل الشمس سراجا والله أنبتكم من العرض نباتا ثم يعيدكم فيها ويخرجكم إخراجا والله جعل لكم الأرض بساطة لتسلكوا منها سبلا فجاجا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى على محمد وعلى محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى has created every human being with the, innate not, with the innate nature or the innate knowledge which allows us to know Him. In terms of what is known as the fitra. The fitra is like a light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places in the heart of every human being. And this light is able to be receptive to the divine light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The narration from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala states, كُلُّ مَوْلُودِ يُولَدْ أَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ That every child when they are born, they are born with this fitrah which allows them to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because of their family, because of community, because of society, it all taints that heart of theirs and takes them away from understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We come forth and we see that these narrations, they continue. And they tell us that the more that we begin to worship, the more that we begin to increase in our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that light begins to become more manifest within our hearts. Until our entire heart is only the light which is receptive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the more that we sin, the more that we transgress, the more that we are forgetful of our responsibilities toward God, we see that that light begins to dim and no longer is it able to become receptive toward the divine light. But in order to awaken that heart, and in order to increase our knowledge, the human being needs to, needs to be in a constant state of reflection. Many narrations of Ahlul Bayt salam, they speak about the importance of spending an hour of our day, or a minute of our day, in contemplation, in reflection, in meditation, in thinking. We come forth and we see one narration, it states, that, wor- that, that contemplating, contemplation for one hour is better than the worship for 60, for 60 years. Meaning that reflection on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the potential to awaken that dead heart, has that potential to allow for the heart to be illuminated with the divine light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allows us to become receptive toward that which is surrounding us. But the question that many people pose over here is then what exactly do we have to contemplate upon? Many people, they make the mistake and they begin to reflect on who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They begin to reflect and they begin to think where did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come from? When we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of how and he's the creator of where and he's the creator of when, this Posing these sorts of questions will allow us to fall into further confusion. Rather, we come and we see a narration from 
Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada alayhi salatu was salam, in which he states, Takallamu fi khalqillah wa la tatakallamu fi Allah. He says, speak about and reflect upon the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thinking about the creation, reflecting upon the creation, reflecting upon your physical surroundings has the potential for you to truly have a better understanding of who is God. But if the moment that you begin to speak and reflect upon the nature and on the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you fall into confusion. So what exactly are the different dimensions that we need to contemplate on then in terms of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We see narrations of Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam. They divide it into four different points. The first point is that we have to reflect upon ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the whole of Quran, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ That we have made manifest the signs within your own selves and within the skies and within the horizons. So the first thing that we need to contemplate upon is ourselves. Take a look when we were a child, how we grew. We take a look at old pictures for instance. The first day, the first week, the first month when we were born, and then you take a look at yourself in the mirror today. And you see how different you have changed. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has supported you over the last 30, 40, 60, 80 years. This itself is a means for us to reflect, a means for us to contemplate. We need to go back and think about ourselves on an even more basic level. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us walking on two feet and not on our fours? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us with ten fingers and not eight? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our eyes on our face and not on our feet? All of these means of questioning are an opportunity for that heart of ours to become more illuminated with the light of fitrah. When we reflect upon ourselves, we come and we begin to think and we begin to recognize the greatness of the power and the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first step, the first thing, the first dimension in terms of contemplation of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that fact that we need to contemplate on our very own selves. سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ Secondly, we need to go ahead and contemplate upon the natural signs which are surrounding us. We need to contemplate upon the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees and the oceans. All of these Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for us to come forth and think about Him. And inshallah, when we get into the verses from chapter 71 of the whole of Quran and continuing our discussion, we see that Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he comes and he presents these sorts of evidences toward the community so that they do their very best to reflect upon that which is surrounding. The third thing that we need to contemplate upon is the verses and the ayat of the whole of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that every single verse in the Arabic language is known as an ayah. Ayah in the Arabic language means a sign. What is the purpose of a sign? A sign is present in order to take you toward a specific destination. Every single verse within the whole of Quran is known as a sign because every single verse in the Quran takes you closer in direction toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ أَلَىٰ قَلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Do not contemplate upon the verses, upon the ayat, upon the signs of the whole of Quran, or do you have this lock upon your heart? And fourthly and finally, when we come toward contemplating the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to reflect upon the greatest signs of God, the most absolute signs of God, the best means to take us toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam. Reflecting upon them, reflecting upon their personalities, reflecting upon their anecdotes, reading about their lives, contemplating upon their narrations, is the best avenue to take us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see in a ziyarah, in one of the ziyarat of Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wa salam, we, we, we address him by calling him, As-salamu alayka ya ayatillah al Peace be upon the greatest sign of God. Because Ahl al-Bayt salam, they shift your attention, they shift our attention directly toward God. Their entire lives, every word of theirs, every moment of that, 
every moment of their dealing with others are all a demonstration in terms of how to get toward God. The way that they demonstrated their humbleness in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they worshipped, when they spoke to people, when they were in battle, the first thing that they thought about was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last thing that they thought about was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every moment within their lives, their hearts and their minds and their souls were directed toward God. But when we go back to our chapter 71 of the whole of Quran and continuing this discussion, we come forth and we see that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they made very strong attempts to shake up the hearts of the people around them by forcing them or by uh, advising them to contemplate, advising them to reflect, advising them to spend a portion of their days in meditation. Over the last couple of nights, we began to reflect in terms of this conversation that Prophet Nuh والسلام, he has with those in his community. He tries to advise them in the night and he tries to advise them in the day. He speaks to them publicly. He speaks to them secretly. He goes toward their homes one by one. They all fail to listen and, ta- and pay heed to what he had to say. So then we went yesterday and we began to discuss Prophet Nuh in terms of his complaints to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he told the community about what they would benefit if they began to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we continue and Prophet Nuh alayhi salam is continuing this discussion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is complaining toward God, supplicating toward Allah, telling him exactly what he was telling these individuals within his community. But even though he continuously preached, as we mentioned, they failed to take heed. We continue with verse number 13 of chapter 71 of the whole of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Prophet Nuh when he states, Ma lakum. La tarjuna lillahi wa qarah. What's wrong with you people? Why do you not understand the authority, the presence, the magnanimity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Don't you think a little bit? Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam, again, is trying to get his community to think a little bit. He's trying to get his community to reflect. Malakum. Literally it means, basically, what's wrong with you? Why don't you think a little bit? Why are you not shaken up by my advices? We mentioned because these individuals, their hearts had transgressed so much. They had committed so much sin. They have violated the authority of the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He used to live amongst them. Which, and that forced them to move away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were unable to be receptive to anything that the Prophet told them. Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, even though he continuously tries his very best to keep on preaching. Malakum la tarjuna lillahi wa qar. Do you not see the great authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Don't you see the sun rise every day? Don't you see it set every evening? Don't you see the moon? Don't you see the sun? Don't you see the stars? Look around you. Look at the perfection of your own creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you so much blessing within your life. Don't you spend a portion of those days to say thanks toward this God who created the heavens and the earth? Malakum, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Don't you understand this authority? The human being needs to recognize some portions in his life, sometimes in his life, that he can't control everything that is around him. Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wasalam, in one of his famous narrations, in one of his famous lines, he states, أَرَفْتُ اللَّهِ al azaim." He said, I've known Allah and I recognize the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over me when my plans, they failed. At the failure of my plans. What does this mean? That sometimes no matter how much we prepare, no matter how much we plan, no matter how much we think that today is going to be the most perfect day, in the morning I'm going to do this, in the afternoon I'm going to do this, in the evening I'm going to do this, what happens? Something happens in the middle of that day, some sort of tragedy sometimes takes place and it completely flips your perception of that day and at that moment you realize that i'm not the one planning this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the planner how many of us have been to a car accident for instance how many of us have had a tragedy in our family how many of us have heard bad news about an unexpected death how many of us have heard about the sad news for instance of someone in your family, amongst your friends in the community, being inflicted with a terminal illness. Did they plan for that in the morning of that day when they heard that news? They didn't plan for it. No one plans for things like that. 
everyone believes that, that their days are going to go just the way that they reflected upon it at the very beginning of that day or the night before or whatever the circumstance. But the minute that that wrench gets thrown, you begin to hold back and you begin to realize, hold on a second. I'm not the one who's the boss of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the authority over this. And perhaps that's all, always a means for us to wake up a little bit and to think and to sit back and say, wait a minute. I need to go back and understand that I need to be a little bit more humble in my life and in my dealings because he is the one who is the governor of all of this. And as we mentioned yesterday, the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he preached toward them. We know that there was a drought taking place within the community. Women were unable to have children. All of this was a punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had instilled upon those people because they failed to repent to him. They failed to repent toward God. They failed to take heed toward the teachings of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet Nuh is saying, now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stripped some of these bounties for you, you still have not woken up, you still don't realize, because we know sometimes when people are going through difficulties, they completely despair. Why is this happening to me? I'm the only one who goes through problems. I'm the only one who goes through difficulties. No. Everyone goes through problems. Everyone goes through challenges. But we have to know that when we have our backs against the wall, that is the time to turn back to, toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Raise your hand, seek forgiveness from Him, and try to build this relationship. Try to build that link with your Creator. مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرَجُّونَ لِلَّهِ وَقَارَ Verse number 13 of Surah Nuh وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ أَطْوَارَ What's wrong with you? Why don't you take heed? In verse number 14, Prophet Nuh salam tells them, don't you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you in stages? Mufassadin of the whole Qur'an, they have two different interpretations for verse number 14 of chapter 71. They say on one level, when Prophet Nuh salam is speaking to this community of his and telling them, don't you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has certainly created you in different stages? He's stating that, look, look at the way that we were. We were created from a drop of water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala developed us into an embryo. Slowly we became a fetus. Slowly we were given birth. How, how much did we weigh? Five, seven, eight pounds. How, how, how tall were we? A foot, 16, 18 inches. And now we're six feet tall, 200, 300, 150 pounds, whatever the circumstance. Look at the way, the development that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. This sort of perfection is so unique. When we are in the wombs of our mother, there is a point in time when we're the size of something that is, you know, we need a microscope to take a look at us. But now look at us now. This perfection in creation developed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been with us from the very beginning. He's been with us from the very beginning. And He's going to be with us after we die. Many people, they become scared at the time of death. Or they, begin, they become scared talking about death. We don't want to talk about this. We don't want to hear about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with you when you were nothing. You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to leave you later on. No. But we have to be amongst those who constantly are turning toward Him, seeking His mercy, building that link with Him, so He remains with us by constantly showering that mercy. So on one side, the Mufassirin of the whole Qur'an, they state that when Prophet Nuh السلام, he addresses his community, وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ أَطْوَارًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you in different stages. He's speaking about the natural progression of the human being. How we go through different phases within our life. We grow in size, we grow in weight, we grow in length, we grow in depth, we grow in all of these different sort of different facets and dimensions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been the means to facilitate all of that. A second group of the, Mufass of the Mufassirin of the Holy Qur'an, they state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he quotes Nuh stating, وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ atwara, He's stating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has surely created you in different dimensions. Meaning what? Meaning that he's created some with very light skin, some with very dark skin, some speaking this language, some having this color eyes, this color hair. He's created us with diversity. And this diversity that we have amongst people coming from different parts of the world, speaking different languages, having different cultures, is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something that should be embraced. It's, some, it, it, it's something that we should deem as beautiful. It's something that we should allow ourselves to reflect upon God more when we see this sort of diversity. Instead of creating division, in, in, instead of segregating one group from another group, from another group, from another group, what we should do is recognize that this is all a means to get closer toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ أَطْوَارًا Verse number 15, Prophet Nuh is again addressing his community. Telling them, 
ألم تروا كيف خلق الله سبع سماوات تباقا He begins by stating ألم ترى ألم ترى in the Arabic language means do you not see But he's not telling them do you not see with your eyes because everyone sees physically It's physical sight doesn't do much for the human being if he doesn't have what is known as insight. He doesn't have the sight of the heart. He doesn't have what is known in the, in, in the language of the ahadith as basira. In the Arabic language, the term basara means to see. Basira means to see, but it means to see with the heart. It means to understand. It means to recognize. It means to build a link. It means to connect with something. When Prophet Nuh salam, is addressing his community, alam taro. He's stating, do you not see with your heart? When they went toward Amir al-Mu'mineen والسلام, and they said, oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, do you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He says, how do I worship a God who I do not see? He's not speaking in terms of the physical eyesight, but he's speaking in terms of the spiritual insight. Amir al-Mu'mineen sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by experiencing him. He feels the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the midst of prayers, in the midst of fasting, while he's performing rituals, while he's making dua, while he's supplicating, so on and so forth. Over here, Nuh is stating, Alam taro. Do you not see with your heart? Kayfa khalaq Allahu sab'a samawatin tabaqa. Have you not seen with your heart how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the seven heavens, one level over the other? The fact that we have the skies, the fact that we have the atmosphere, the fact that we can breathe in oxygen, these are all signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all see it, we all deal with it on a physical basis, but most of us, we fail to even think about it. We fail to reflect upon it in the slightest. Let me give you an example. We see, for instance, that when a child is born, a child, as part of this fitrah, as part of that child's innate nature, is very, very curious. A child likes to see. A child likes to hear. A child is often very attentive to, you know, bright lights and especially nature. If you take a child who's a year, two years old outside, they love to be outside. They love to look at the sun. They love to look at the trees. It's part of our innate nature to be curious when reflecting upon the natural signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why when a child becomes a little bit older and is able to speak, we know that they always ask why. Why did this happen? Why is the sky blue? Why are the trees green? Right? They always ask why because curiosity is something that is innate within us. But oftentimes we see that now in our you know, adolescence, in our older age, we begin to realize that we don't really care about nature that much. We drive on the highway for two, three, four hours a day, 15 hours a week. But most of us, we probably fail to reflect for one moment about the nature that is surrounding us. Maybe once in a while, on the first of the month of Ramadan, we begin to look for the moon, and when we see the moon, we say, oh, mashallah, this is very nice, right? But we're not really looking at it in terms of recognizing that these are all signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see that what happens is, as we grow, as we become more materialistic, as we're living in the societies and in the communities and in the families that we're living in, this curiosity dies down. We no longer wake up toward seeing all of these signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognizing that there's something really, really unique and something really, really amazing. But if we spend a portion of our days, for instance, every day, at least during the holy month of Ramadan, once a week, when we're driving, sitting outside, uh, going to the beach, going to the park, we look up at the sky, we look at the water, we look at the sand, we look at the trees and we say, wow, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all of this, that's something. And when we do things like that, again, it allows for that light in the heart that we mentioned at the beginning of the lecture to slowly become more manifest. It allows for that heart to become illuminated. It allows for us to become more receptive toward everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. Because as we see within the whole of the Quran, for those of us who are reading the whole of the Quran during the holy month of Ramadan, Inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst the readers of the whole Qur'an We see that how many times does God often present these sorts of examples toward us If you want to know God, reflect upon the creation We go back toward the verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Nuh Alam taro Do you not see Kayfa khalaq Allah sab'a samawatin tabata Do you not see how God has created the seven heavens layer after another When we go toward this particular verse and the fact that several times within the whole Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the seven skies or the seven heavens. Many people, they don't know what that means. And if you go toward the Mufassirin, they themselves, they state, we don't really know. This is, might be a secret from the secrets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
We see that as technology, as science is beginning to progress during these days and over the next hundred, over the next thousand years, perhaps you're going to be able to know and understand what that really means. For there's another verse in the whole Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that we've created this universe and it's ever expanding. During, you know, if we were in 6th century Arabia during the time of the Holy Prophet, people would have no idea what it means when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating that the universe is constantly expanding. And perhaps at this point in time, in the year 2016, we have no idea what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means when He states that there are six sky, six, seven skies, layer after another. We don't know. We have to submit to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this universe. It's absolutely massive. He has created it, he has created it for our disposal and one of those benefits that we need to attain in these days is to be in reflection of that which is surrounding us. So again he states in verse number 15 Verse number 16 and we have appointed, and he has appointed, again, Nuh is telling his community, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed the moon. He has created the moon. وَجَعَلَ الْقَمَرَ فِيهِنَّ نُورًا He has created the moon, and he has appointed it to be a light. In the middle of the dark, in the middle of the night, we said the night, the, the, that the moon is a light for the world. When we go again in the middle of the night, and you look up at the moon, a full moon, how bright it is, how beautiful it is, we see that that is a means again to cause us to reflect or which should be leading us to reflect. And without the moon, we see that scientists and you know, professionals in this field, they would state that the ecosystem of the earth would not be what it is today if, there was, if the moon, for instance, was not present. وَجَعَلَ الْقَمَرَ فِيهِنَّ نُورًا وَجَعَلَ, وجعل الشَّمْسَ سِرَاجًا and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also created and appointed the sun as a means to be a lantern for the earth. Without the sun, what would we do? Without the sun, there would be no products of photosynthesis. Without the sun, there would be no heat. Without the sun, there would be no light. How many of us have gone into sujood, and I remind myself before I remind you, and thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He has created the sun? Probably something that none of us have ever even thought about. Thanking Allah for the sun, but if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create the sun, what would happen? If for one day we did not have the sun, what would happen? If you put an individual, if you yourself lock yourself into a room and you close all of the window shades, all of the blinds, and you had to spend the entire day in your house without any sort of light entering into it, what would you do? You'd go crazy. Some people, if they don't go outside of their house every one day or two days, they can't deal with it anymore. They have to go out. They have to go for a walk. They have to go for a run. They just have to go out for, you know, to see the sun, to breathe the air. Imagine we didn't have the sun. Imagine we lived our lives in darkness completely. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of His wisdom, He creates the sun. Out of, he, from that sun, we extract heat and we extract light and all of these other benefits. But at the same time, out of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He allows for the sun to set or He allows for the rotation of the earth to take place where we have time for rest. We don't like to sleep when the sun is up. It's very difficult, right? When the sun is shining on your face, when you wake up in the morning, you know, man, it's time to get up. You prefer to sleep with darkness. Who sleeps with the light on? No one does that. Out of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has allowed for the sun to set so that we can have rest in the night. And too much sun, what happens? Potentially skin diseases, cancer, all of these different types of, you know, ailments that could take place from people being exposed too much to the sun, right? Imagine we didn't have the sun. Photosynthesis wouldn't take place. Without the process of photosynthesis, what would happen? We wouldn't have plants, we wouldn't have vegetation. What would we eat? How would I put sugar in my tea in the next 30 minutes or so? How would it happen, right? Without sugar, we wouldn't be able to be very happy people. When you go ahead and eat a cheeseburger, what do you want to put on that cheeseburger? You need to have bread, the grain. We need the sun, right? You need lettuce, you need a tomato, you need that meat. That meat comes from the cow. What does the cow eat? The cow eats the grass, it needs the vegetation, right? Without the sun, we don't have anything. But how many times did we ever think about thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for creating the sun? Prophet Nuh is advising his community, but at the same time, we need to extract lessons from it as well. وَجَعَلَ الْقَمَرَ فِيهِنَّ نُورًا وَجَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ سَرَاجًا Verse number 17, وَاللَّهُ أَنْبَتَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ نَبَاتًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has then created you from the earth and allowed you to grow. This is how the literal translation of this verse is. 
And the Mufassan of the whole Qur'an, they differ in regards to what does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating that we have created you from there. He's stating on, some Mufassalin, they state on one level, it's because of the fact that we eat and the fact that we grow from the benefits of that which comes out from the earth, we grow naturally on the basis of what we eat. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quoting Nuh, when Nuh is telling his community that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you from the earth, meaning that you benefit from everything which is within the earth. On another flip side, we come forth and we see another group of the Mufassalin, they state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating that when, when he states that we have created you from the earth, meaning that we come from the earth, we come from dust, we come from clay. Wallahu ambatakum min al ardi nabata. In verse number 18, he continues, Thumma yu'idukum fiha wa yukhrijukum ikhraja. And then you return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we take that particular commentary of that verse, then it makes a lot of sense. Then you return back toward the earth. When we pass away, where are we going to go? We're going to go back into the earth. Our bodies, are going to de- our bodies are going to decay. We are made from clay and we're going to return back to clay. We're going to return back to dust. Then he will remove you again. He will remove, you, he will remove us again and raise us on the day of judgment. And then we begin to live that eternal life again. What's the purpose of all of this? Nu is trying to wake up the people. Know that you've, cre- you've been created from nothing. Don't think that you're going to live forever. Don't think that you own this universe. You came from dirt and you're going to return back to dirt. And then he's going to raise you again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues quoting Nuh in verse number 18. ثُمَّ يُعِيدُكُمْ وَيُخْرَجُكُمْ إِخْرَاجًا وَاللَّهُ جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ بِسَاطًا and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has then created this vast earth. وَجَعَلَ لَكُمْ He has created this world for you. This entire world, the globe, the map that we take a look at today, this entire world, the ocean, the continents, the land, the islands, it's all created for humanity. It's for us. But it's our fault, the fact that we have created such divisions. In the religion of Islam, in true Islamic governance, there is no such thing, for instance, as the necessity to hold a passport or visas. If you want to go for Hajj, you can go for Hajj. If you want to go for Ziyara, you don't need to wait for a visa. If you want to go to Mexico, there should be no wall being built, no border control. We don't have any of this in the religion of Islam. The world is for everyone. We have the ability, we should be having the ability to take benefit from everything. We come forth and we see many verses of the whole Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, that when, you, when you're not able to practice your faith, when you're not able to practice your religion within a specific location, then go and travel. See the vastness of this world. Go and travel. In fact, narrations of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, they don't, for instance, hinder or tell people to not go for holidays, not, for not people to go for vacation. They should go. In fact, they even encourage narrations of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, state that when you go for vacation, when you go travel, when you go see new places, Make sure that you spend a portion of that time visiting these places and reflecting upon that which happened. Go ahead and, for instance, read, read up on the history of that city that you go and visit. Go visit Rome. Go visit Greece. Go visit the whole entire world, no problem. But make sure that you spend a day in the midst of your vacation, perhaps, right? To go and study about the history of that particular location. Go see what happened to the people before. Go see the development of that civilization. Why? Again, because it allows you to reflect on how humanity progresses on how civilization progresses, on how the earth and how the ocean and how the land within that particular region progresses. These are all signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he continues in verse number 19, and the last verse for our discussion tonight. Wallahu ja'ala lakumul arva bisata. In verse number 20. لِتَسْلُكُوا minha subulan fijaja. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this land, He has made this world very vast for you to travel in, right? Not only should you go and visit, but he, you want to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated that travel for us. We are able to travel by land, we are able to travel by air, we are able to travel by ocean. All of this has been created to allow, to facilitate for the human being to reflect. And constant reflection, constant contemplation, constant meditation upon the natural signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have the ability again to awaken the heart. And the goal of all of this is for us to sit back sometimes and be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of these things that we have. The fact that we have oceans, the fact that we have the sun, the fact that we have the moon, all of these things we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. 
we come forth and we see, for instance, that the word in the Arabic language, in the narrations of Ahl al-Bayt, that they advise us in terms of how to be thankful to Allah is what? It's to state Alhamdulillah. Whenever any sort of blessing descends upon us, we state Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. For you are the one who has created us. You are the one who has directed these blessings upon us. Constant recitation of Alhamdulillah is a good thing. But constant recitation of, of, of Alhamdulillah with ma'rafa, with knowledge of what you're saying, is something completely different. For instance, if today I'm walking outside of the masjid and I'm going back toward my car and I'm looking at the sun up in the sky, and you say, Alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful day, it's nice, it's warm, it's not raining. Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah for all of this. Or a better example, you're walking in the middle of a garden in the park and you see a plant, right? You see a plant, you see a tree, you see a flower, and you say, wow, that plant is really, really beautiful. You say, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this beautiful flower. And you continue on your way, you continue to walk, and you don't give it any other thought. A couple of moments later, another man begins to walk in that park. And he sees that flower and he picks it up, and he smells it, he looks at it, he takes a picture of it, right? That individual has a little bit more knowledge of the blessings of that flower because he touched it, because he smelt it. And he says, Alhamdulillah, not only is this flower very beautiful, look at the texture, look at the color, look at the scent. It has a lot of blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. But then you go ahead and a couple of moments later, another person walks through that particular park, through that particular garden, and they see that flower. But this individual is an expert in plants, right? He goes and he begins to reflect and he begins to think, wow, the process that took place for this plant, for this flower to grow and for it to demonstrate itself like this, so on and so forth, his alhamdulillah is at an even higher level. Right? Then, for instance, Ali ibn Abi Talib, السلام, he enters into the garden. He enters into the park and he picks up that flower. And he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this entire universe. And this is a sign that takes us closer toward him. His alhamdulillah is far different than ours, isn't it? Saying alhamdulillah, being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is good. But being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with understanding the details and the specifics of how we have been created or what we are actually being thankful for is completely different. So we need to make sure that we allow and elevate ourselves to the next level in terms of being thankfulness, in terms of demonstrating our thankfulness toward God, and that is by constant reflection. I will conclude with this one anecdote. One day, Musa alayhi salam, he raised his hands toward Allah, and he says, Oh Allah, tell me who is the most thankful, or demonstrate toward me, who is the most thankful of all of your creation." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Musa, Musa kalimillah, the one who is to speak to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh Musa, that tomorrow morning, after the morning prayers, exit your home and go toward the nearby river. From a distance, see that there is one man, he's an elderly man, look at him from a distance, and he is the most thankful of all of my creation. So it is said that Musa alayhi salam set out that next morning, and he went out, and he said that that individual was a woodcutter. His responsibility was to go toward the forests, cut off some wood, cut, you know, cut them into little pieces, and sell them, like they, had, like they used to do back in the day. And he said that that man was very, very frustrated. From the morning till the evening, Musa Ali Salam is watching him, but no one comes and purchases any wood from him. He begins to get depressed, but he's looking, he's positive, he doesn't see him, the fact that he's really falling into any sort of depression. He's content. He remains patient. At the end of the day, this man, perhaps a little bit dejected, but with a little bit of optimism, he begins to pile up his wood and say, tomorrow I'm going to have to try this again. No one purchased anything for me. And he begins to pile it up when all of a sudden, there's a man who enters into his proximity. This man, in his bag, he has two loaves of um, stale bread, stale bread extremely hard. He goes toward this man and Musa is watching, trying to take the lesson and trying to see how this man is the most thankful of all people. This man, he comes toward this individual, the woodcutter, and he says, look, I need two pieces of wood. The man says, it's going to cost you this. He says, I don't have that. But what I do have is two pieces of stale bread. At this moment, the man gets excited. He says that I'm selling this wood so I can eat some food. He says, no problem. You give me the two pieces of stale bread for, and I'll give you two pieces of wood. 
They make the trade and they said that at this moment Musa alayhi salam understands what it means to be thankful. Why? He sees that man, he goes closer toward that river. Remember he lives on the river bank or he's working on the river bank. He goes, he sits down on the ground, he begins to take the bread, dip it into the ocean in order to make it soft so he can eat it. And then he looks toward the sun setting and he says, Oh Allah, alhamdulillah, all praise is due to you, all thanks is due to you. What do I need that is better than all of this? I have food, I have this beautiful sight, I have this sun setting down upon me, I'm sitting next to the water. This is what it means to be thankful to you, O oh Allah. Thank you for all of the blessings that you have given me. True thankfulness in the eyes of Musa salam, at this moment were understood. What is it? It means someone who's content with that which they have. Someone who's content, understanding and recognizing that whatever they have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all the signs, these are all the means for us to get closer toward God. But it, it is upon us to, step number one, reflect upon them. And step number two, to be in constant thankfulness toward Him. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're able to take lessons from the ayat and the verses of the whole of Quran. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to continue. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad. Wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.